Um, well, hi, everybody. I'd like to just introduce uh, Gavin Ferris and Drew Endy um, to you. And we have two talks today uh, looking at open frameworks in very different areas of technology. Uh, one looking at uh, uh, hardware and microelectronics based um, open systems, and the other looking at the need, growing need for the similar kind of approaches, open approaches in biology. And uh, so Gavin is associated with the Low Risk Project, and he's going to talk to us today about some of the or the Open Titan project around uh, security and building systems which are open for collaboration and use um, in, in uh, microelectronics. And Drew will talk us, um, you know, both of these are important practitioners in the field. And Drew's going to talk to us about his work over the years trying to develop um, open frameworks for biology as well. And um, Drew is the um, founder of the Biobricks Foundation, which is a a Stanford based organization uh, looking at how you can develop open tools and te technologies uh, for use in synthetic biology. And we've got the two talks lined up. And what we'll do is we'll have the two talks uh, around about 20 minutes each and then open up for questions. And uh, on our list, Gavin is first. So, Gavin, would you like to uh, fire away? Okay, perfect. So, uh, well, thanks, Jim, and hello, everyone. My name's uh, Gavin Ferris, as Jim said. I'm the pro bono CEO and co-founder of, of Low Risk CIC, and I'm here to, to talk at Professor Azalov's uh, invitation about Low Risk's business model. And I should say at once that we're absolutely not a synthetic biology firm, so my knowledge of that would be fascinating domain is epic in its paucity. But nevertheless, I, I think our work um, potentially has some interesting applications to the development of open source intellectual property in synthetic biology and indeed in a number of other engineering fields which don't have the luxuries of software development you know a point i'll expand on um, during the talk um, so let's begin at the beginning with a very brief overview of low risk itself we're a, a non-profit uk-based company a cic we do have a profit uh, public interest goal to help make open source silicon reality at a very high level, that means making the sort of chip designs that companies like ARM might license for money available to anyone to use and extend for free. And we were spun out of the University of Cambridge Computer Lab um, six and a half years ago. Um, Loris Heller, two co-founders, Dr. Rob Mullins and Alex Bradbury, were previously involved in the early stages of Raspberry Pi Foundation. Rob was one of his co-founders. And we used some of the secret sauce from that fantastic success story. You know, the Raspberry Pi is now the world's most single, uh, most successful single board computer in shipping our own business model. Um, and also um, Professor Andy, Sir Andy Hopper, who is the, who was the, you know, ran the computer lab for many years. Um, this is an example of his uh, new labs um, sort of structure that he's sort of pioneered. Um, so our model is similar to, um, but crucially, and I'll talk about that shortly, different from examples that we've seen in the open source software world. And we've stood up the organization so far with around 15 staff growing fast and without recourse to government funding at all while remaining on conflicted. So our, um, Main project is Open Titan, and I'm not going to talk about that in any in any depth, but just to sort of give some sort of context. Um, it's the world's um, first open source silicon root of trust design, and it's currently actually the world's largest, as far as we know anyway, open source silicon design project full stop, which is pretty exciting. And we're building that in partnership with Google and others. Um, it's uh, designed um, uh, to be the blueprint of, of, for a standalone security chip, silicon root of trust, which, you know, as the name suggests, um, is for use in both data center servers and endpoints like laptops um, to guarantee certain critical security properties. So for example, um, secure boot. So first signature uh, integrity as it's called. The BIOS, the very lowest level operating system starts up with a machine called boots. Um, the root of trust checks that it's, its signature is valid and if so allows it to boot. But if for some reason it's been hacked um, or corrupted, it prevents, it prevents it booting. And does that independently from the operating system because of that very low level operating system, the BIOS is corrupt, and that then anything built into the higher levels of the operating system, like antivirus, is academic. It's moot because the game's already over. And similarly, presuming that the system does boot successfully, it also provides a secure place to store things like network keys independently from the operating system, and that reduces the attack surface um, and, and improves security. So there are other features as well. You know, they're on some of them are on the slide, and you can look at OpenTitan.org and our GitHub repository. So that's not the point of this presentation. What's more interesting and relevant is that we're building Open Titan in partnership with Google, Western Digital, Seagate, and a coalition of other partners. The logos you can see on the, the bottom of the screen, and a number of other major sort of household names in the final stages of, of sign up. So kind of watch this space. And we're releasing the source code and uh, source code and design documents and data for that project as we go on GitHub, which is a popular code sharing repository under a permissive license, Apache 2, free for everyone to use, review, and benefit from. So our part in helping that coalition to sort of come about 
get to the stage, and this is a you know going to be a real shipping um, silicon very shortly. Um, particularly when you appreciate that some of those com companies are direct competitors, and our sort of stewardship role in in that uh, as a funded upstream has implications. We we believe for how open IP and innovation can be managed and crucially funded in many other real world domains, such as with the potentially synthetic biology. So let's dive into that next. So. What's the core problem? The main problem that is encountered by many who are attracted to the ideas of open IP, which of course has any number of benefits for innovation, is actually quite a surprising one. And it's it's a sort of a success disaster, if you like. It's the success of open source software. Now that success has come about, you know, primarily, although not only, um, but primarily through the huge penetration of the open source operating system Linux and other similar free Unix variants, which now power essentially every modern mobile phone. Um, Every single supercomputer, essentially, that's in, in mainstream use, half of the infotainment system in new cars, you know, most of the world's mobile data infrastructure, containerization technologies is used in edge and AI, and the list goes on. Um, so um, that's a huge success, and it's fantastic, but it's led many to emulate that success by doing the same things, and that is the problem because they're not the same. So software is an atypical case. Um, it's uh, it's a in terms of design paradigm. It's, it's Something of a false friend because silicon design and actually pretty much any other real world engineering endeavor, which is why I think our learnings are relevant in this forum, is different. So you can see on the table, and there's only a few of the, 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 the points, but um, in software, there are plenty of software engineers, dev tools, kind of free, pretty much design turnarounds often only months for products. Um, bugs can be fixed for the most part after deployment, just ship a patch. There's no there there in terms of the product, it's just no real physical thing, it's just bits in a, in a, in a cloud that you can download. And you can actually build an end-to-end -end product that has no um, closed source IP in it at all if, if, if you want. Um, that's, that's generally possible. But silicon design is different, and that's true for most engineering things. By contrast, there are relatively few qualified engineers. The tooling is really expensive and proprietary. It takes years generally to build these things. If you get a hardware bug, then post-release, it's off the way to fix it. So the quality bar has to be higher. Um, uh, the actual costs of you know, producing the masks and distribution and supply chain and so on are, are real. You can't get away from that physical reality thing has to be fabbed. All that costs money and all of it has to be upfront funded. So for example, I can sit in my bedroom and make a, you know, contribute a patch to the Linux kernel and have it reviewed and accepted. And apart from our costs and in terms of time, that's free, right? And that can go into millions of systems worldwide you know, the next month. To, uh, by contrast, to build something like uh, you know, uh, Marvell's reported costs in the register of building a seven nanometer system and chip would be $50 million engineering time, mass fabrication costs just to get to the first spin, which might have bugs in it. So these are real, real costs and, and they have to be dealt with. So low risks uh, approach was, was, was done explicitly to address that disconnect, trading on the, you know, our co-founders experience with Raspberry Pi and utilizing concepts of the new lab structure. Um, created by um, Professor Sandy Hopper. So we wanted to build an approach to open source silicon design that was credible, sustainable, and impactful. I mean, those are platitudinous terms, but um, we've learned quite a bit on our journey since then to get to where we are now that um, we've, 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 we've got some concrete um, details behind that, which I'm going to share under those three headings in this presentation, which hopefully will be slightly less obvious and, and, and perhaps of use. So. Let's dive into that first. So, credible. What does it take to stand up a credible open source hardware operation that can be taken seriously by first tier, tier players, people like Google and, and Western Digital and so on? So, we know that a number of the approaches that you might take don't work very well. Um, haven't, haven't, some of them have success stories, but mostly they, they, they fail for this kind of thing, for open source um, silicon design anyway. Um, for example, put for profits together, then conflict of interest will limit their degree and scope of cooperation. And, their publicly released IP will be treated with some suspicion. You know, how long is it going to be around for? Will it be compatible? Is it just embrace and extend? Universities aren't really in the business of maintaining high quality IP. They might come up with a clever idea, but commercializing and maintaining it, that's outside their remit. Um, donated IP, here's the stuff from my previous generation, my cast offs, feel free to use it. That bit rots, people won't, therefore you use it. Specification that approaches, make the specification first and everyone follows it. Works well in telecoms, works very prescriptive. Doesn't really work well in fluid hardware and software design spaces and tends to fail. The specs just get ignored. And then most then community-led engineering has notched up successes, but they've been in the software domain. And so people look at that, try to read across, try to build an equivalent hardware approach and fail because of the, the table I've just sort of shown. So our approach then was a different one. So we said, no, no, we want to do something a little bit differently. We have to be an engineering company, first of all. So we can't just be some sort of coordinator. We're a CIC, we're a non-profit, but we have full stack competences called 
of digital verification and firmware and tool engineers so that we can contribute. For example, we've contributed 40, 40% of the, the commits, um, the code to Open Titan. Um, and we can also you know, speak and be heard with, with relevance because we actually know what we're, we're looking at because we're actually part of the coding effort. Um, we're a nonprofit where we don't have shareholders. We can't be bought. Um, so of course, Red Hat bought, uh, was bought by IBM for $34 billion. So, you know, the danger is that a successful open source organization might get snapped up. And that's always a concern if you're, if you're participating in a project in midstream. So that can't happen with us. We stay small, we are growing, but we're trying to, you know, be focused and remain below 50 people. We do maintain close contact with universities, you know, Cambridge University, obviously we span out from that, but ETH Zurich um, contributed the CPU core that we use. We've worked with the University of Manchester IT projects, and that's good for them because we can do some of that maintenance work that they don't want to do. And more importantly, then we're a trusted steward of these real-world projects like Open Titan, partnering with major organizations with a well-defined business need. And that's the foundation of why they, they'll pay, and I'll come back to that in a second. So that we then ensure also that the foundational IP, the building blocks that come out of those designs, like the CPU core, um, like the crypto accelerators or something, that they're published for use under uh, by others who can then pick them up. So if you want to use our CPU core to build your smart doorbell or whatever it is you want to use, you can do it. It's got nothing to do with the root of trust, but it's a, it's a general purpose design that's going to be around for a while. So our, our goal then is to sit as, you know, at, at the middle as a catalyst, if you like, in the middle of these um, groups, which, none of which are, are able to do this open source thing by themselves, but with the addition of uh, an open source uh, um, steward, uh, an unconflicted one like Lewis, um, they can. So let's now talk about sustainability, which is um, the second of those components. So we're a nonprofit, but you know we want to be non-loss as well. We need funding. So where do we get that funding from? As you might think, governments would fund this stuff, right? Because this is all for public good. But no, um, you know they have a they have an innovation comfort zone, are intended, and they won't really step outside it. So we've at least find it difficult to get significant funding from government, and we we have this is all being privately funded, which means means therefore that you have to get that commercial funding and you know given those lengthy timelines it's multi-year commitment you know significant you know seven eight figure sums that you need so why would a for-profit company want to do that what's in it for them well we've been exclusively funded by the private sector and the, the primary motivator that we have found is quite surprising well, from the outset you know view is surprising and let's try to summarize it here. They, it, it allows these companies to safely upstream their downside differentiators, right? So that sounds like MBA mode on there, but I'll unpack that in a second. I, it, does, it does mean something, I promise you. The secondary motivators obviously are improved security. You know, this whole, you know, Kirchhoff's principle, the only secret thing in a, in a well-designed um, uh, cryptography system should be the key. Optics, of course, it does look good for them to be supporting open source. And more importantly now, in growing importance, this ability to facilitate second source of supply, you know, that they're able to get silicon from multiple places. Let's dive into that a little bit. So that safely upstreaming the downside differentiators, what the, does that mean? So well, downside differentiator is something that isn't a, a unique selling point for your business until it goes wrong, right? If you, when you sell planes, you know, people don't buy them because they stay up, but certainly won't buy them if they don't stay up in the air. They, they buy them for other reasons. Similarly, security for a server, it's kind of a given. And the problem is that, that downside, if that risk to your business from failure of these things is bad enough, then companies will end up buying or building, sorry, the components that are crucial to those properties in-house, um, tying up valuable engineering resource in so doing, right? So that's opportunity cost. Now they'd like to buy a commercial off-the-shelf replacement, but they feel they can't do it safely because what's in there, right? What's in that? root of trust chip you, you, you know you, you just bought from you know a, a random third party company and unless you know you're not going to take that risk so you're tied to that kind of treadmill so how do you get around that well the open source approach can potentially solve that because it allows these companies to publish and work on uh, in a collaborative way a clean room design version of their own design which they can then hand off for maintenance by others uh, in exchange for that ip being usable by everyone that's an upstreaming process it's a reversal of the usual roles of producer and consumer of intellectual property and really the key metric that drives this for companies is I'm giving away this value to other people, but is that less than my in-house you know, maintenance cost? If it is, I'll do it. And that's proven to be the case. So it's a bit surprising, but that is sort of the key motivator that we've found. So upstreaming, I'm not going to go into some detail. I, I give a Royal Society talk, Zero and Everyone, which is linked on the slide, and which I do go into a lot more detail. But the basic idea of normal upstreaming, it's an open source process. Um, and you have these repositories of, 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 uh, of, of, of um, components, and they are components usually, small libraries or whatever, but let's say a cryptography library, in this case it's A, it's maintained, it's owned conceptually by their maintainers, the upstream, and they release versions of it to people 
usually companies and but can be individuals who consume that and put it into designs on which they compete. They are downstream. So that's the conventional flow. And then what sometimes happens, of course, is a, a particular company might put in some skunk works changes to a particular component A um, and make it faster and better for them, um, which is fine until the inevitable happens and upstream, which is uh, oblivious to their skunk works changes, releases a new version, which, you know, of course it is, is incompatible with those changes, breaks them. And now that company's got this problem. What do they do? You know, if they um, keep their, if they keep using the old version of the library, it's going to get, you know, they know their, their, their problems with it, know their bugs with it. Um, and it'll get worse and worse and more and more divergent over time. On the other hand, if they fix their fixes to make them compatible with the new version, then they're going to have to keep doing that in perpetuity. Those engineers are now tied to that, um, you know, uh, component essentially forever. And it was supposed to be somebody else's problem that wasn't supposed to be there at work. So what most companies then do is they say, okay, tell you what, we'll upstream that. We'll produce, in this case, it's, it's called a pull request. The changes that we've made to that library, some documentation of it, we'll send it upstream. We'll, we'll tell the maintainers upstream about it. They will then review it, and if they like it, they'll pull it into their, their master copy of the repository. They'll then distribute it um, downstream to others, and that's a public benefit, right? Fantastic. So now that work that Company X has done is available to everyone else. But, you know, in exchange for that sort of altruistic act, they get to move those developers off onto other products. So there is a, 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 an opportunity cost benefit, and that is important, really, because um, that balancing off of maintenance costs versus um, local benefit when when seen at a, at a not just a sort of single component scale but at a product scale is the driver behind our business model that's what people pay for right it's the ability to make it someone else's problem to walk away from it, but still be able to trust it that we are that because it's something you're relying on right that's what they want they, they still want to compete on stuff they still want to compete on that thing they want it to become a commodity safely and that's what they'll pay for so another key element is second sourcing, you know, when you, uh, both because we've had the big chip squeeze recently, you know, it's sort of hitting out, you can't get your, you know, your modern cars and so on because there's no, no, there's no silicon available. Um, and similarly, it's, it's, it's impacting on consumer manufacturers as well. And there's also geo geopolitical concerns, you know, 60% plus of the world's silicon is made in Taiwan over half of it's made by one vendor, TSMC. So what happens if for one reason or other, those go down. So you'd like to be able to get your silicon from multiple places, right? Second source it. Um, but the problem with that is that there's a lot. If you look at the, the design stack of a root of trust, and it's true for most um, chips, um, shown on the right of the slide, most of it, the pink bit, the mystery meat, if you'll excuse the term of art, which is tied to, uh, is closed source, or it's tied to a particular um, uh, uh, process node or tied to a particular foundry is quite extensive. And that holds you, ties you to that one foundry. You can't walk away with your design and get it made somewhere else in parallel. With open Titan and with open designs, a lot less mystery meat. Still some, and you have to deal with that, I'll come back to that point later, um, but a lot less. And so it makes it easier to do the second sourcing. And so that's another key thing that people, it turns out, will pay for. Um, besides funding, staffing is a key thing. I see it's more of a problem than, you know, it's something to be continuously dealt with. As an open source company, uh, a non-profit open source company, you know, there are lots of issues around how you motivate staff. And, really, you know, because you haven't got equity, you haven't got share options, you haven't got profit bonuses. So what do you do? You know, we've found that, you know, tying our you know, salaries to base remuneration is important. Braided careers, a lot of people to move in now of academia, part time, um, flexible working, some 10 percent time, some tinkering time so that people can contribute to open source more broadly. And also, of course, requiring partner orgs to contribute full time engineers, FTEs, not just funding. And, you know, obviously doing your, your tier two visa sponsorship and stuff. So staffing is a key issue. Okay, so the, the last part then is how do you get impact? So we've shown how you know our approach helps um, potentially the for-profit companies that contribute get what they want, which is to be able to you know make it someone else's problem. These key things while still trusting the output components. But what about us? How do we get what we want? So the key thing that we find here is really dealing with boundaries, the sort of interfaces between, in all senses of the word. Um, so. The, first, the point I'll return to this in a second, but dealing with things at product scope so that the components of that product can be reused. So, you know, build a complete root of trust design so that the CPU core can be reused by someone rather than building the CPU core and hoping that someone will build it into something downstream because that CPU core floating in a, in a, in a, in a jar um, doesn't tend to get used by anyone and it tends to have inappropriate interfaces and so on. So it's better to build a complete thing. 
Secondly, you know, ensure that you've enforced interfaces between developers, coding standards, protocols, you know, races. You're doing this thing in a distributed manner and distributed orgs have to have explicit um, sign off flows and so on. It's not exciting, but it's necessary. And ditto for the interface between orgs themselves, governance structure. So project director, steering committee, technical committee, standing meetings, setting up a roadmap, all that stuff has to be put into the legals, put into the governance done up front again. You know, this is stuff that's a sort of byproduct resource of what we've done because we could take some of the open stuff that we've done in Open Titan and low risk and reuse it for other things. And we'd be happy to share some of that. It's helpful. Um, similarly, there's this project product split. So what does that mean? Well, the product is the thing, the actual physical chip that's been fabbed somewhere, and that has some of that. Remember that pink mystery meat. There's some of that in there that you can't get away from. So how do you avoid that closed source stuff polluting your open source domain? How do you manage that boundary? Because you have to. You can't get away from it. Similarly, licensing terms, make sure they're clear from the contributors. You don't want the thing being viral like GPL3 where you touch it and everything becomes GPL3. People obviously stay away from that, they don't like it. We use Apache 2, but similarly, people who use it want to know that they're not going to get sued. So how do you manage the patent licenses and so on around it? And similarly, make sure your project management flows are, are clear and so on. It's some, a lot of the stuff afterwards, it's kind of obvious and yeah, you do it that way, but doing a distributed multi-geography, multi-org project is, is not straightforward. Um, so remember, coming back to scope, remember the con conventional uh, upstreaming model is people provide little libraries or components on the GitHub, you know, and you can use them as parts of your design. We took a different approach. Our approach was to be the steward of a complete project block of IP, right? So in this case, open tighten all the different bits of it, the CPU core, you know, the, the boot ROM, the crypto accelerators, all those different bits. And we're actually working on it in the development phase with companies downstream, like Google, Western Digital, Seagate, so that would be X, Y, Z, and they're putting engineers and, you know, on, on the project. And actually, they've got more engineers uh, than we do. Right, at the moment. In fact, and that's natural. And in, in fact, um, because Google have built these kinds of chip before in-house, that's the treadmill they're trying to get off. So they start off as the experts, and they're working with us in Western Digital, and Seagate, building a clean room version of that that they can then hand over um, to us to maintain. And that's the point. So it's a big scale version of that. Thing that i showed earlier so the point of them doing that and paying us money is that in the maintenance phase they can move almost all of their developers off onto other stuff and they can use the ip that they have created through it, the open titan ip and the derivative products from that safe in the knowledge that it's safe right which is which is good right so it's not some weird off the shelf thing that they aren't, aren't sure of because if it's wrong and the security of these things wrong it'll blow up their company but similarly, we can do that knowing that downstream people can then use the component blocks, which will have a life because we've been paid to maintain it, right? And they've been designed to the very highest quality standards. So you can take the CPU core, for example, and use it, and people have, in your other derivative products, that sort of black block on the, on the bottom right. So um, that is the thing, the project, product boundary, I won't go into that in detail, it's because I'm running out of time, but that's something you really have to deal with that doesn't really come up in software, but I'm sure it does come up in other domains. Um, and the last point is just the governance structure. So we've built a governance structure around this, which, which ensures that those boundaries are well maintained and tended um, and such that um, we, we get what we want to make sure that IP gets published, but it's clear when, for the participants what they're getting in terms of their the money that they're putting in, in terms of their steering committee seat and their, their, their influence on the project roadmap and so on. And that's not just for Open Titan, that's something that can be replicated for others. And we, again, we'd be happy to talk to people about that if that's something that's of use. So in summary then, um, this, this is the final slide. So uh, our, um, we built put together a, a model in which we believe we have managed to deliver what we set out to do, which is a model that's credible and sustainable and impactful, which allows you know, companies to get what they want, which is to be able to hand off this, this IP uh, and have it maintained uh, and then use the, 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 the fruits of that. And for us, we get to create these foundational IP blocks that can then be used by an academia, can also be used by new startups to you know, build their own things. Um, and that's well funded and, and, and is done in a way that isn't conflicted. So um, I think that our case is more in common with most engineering fields, including perhaps your own, than pure software engineering does. And so hopefully the lessons that we've learned uh, you know, many of the hard way about how to build this will be of interest to parallel endeavors in the synthetic biology space. And that's the end of the presentation. So thanks for your attention. Hey, thanks very much, Gavin. So the way we're going to run this is we're going to about to dive straight into synthetic biology with Drew and we'll save all the questions for the end. So Drew, can I invite you to? Thanks.
Thanks, everyone. Uh, the, the context here is um, uh, we're heading into a second full genetic engineering generation and biology as a platform for manufacturing stuff is powered naturally by 90 terawatts of photosynthesis. Um, and then it uses that energy to organize materials. It grows stuff wherever the biology is. And, and so fully realized biotechnology promises to enable a flourishing civilization on this planet in, um, uh, in a way that's compatible with the rest of life on Earth. We're very far away from that right now. Um, the lessons I'm representing here today are my personal views on what's developed over the last 20 years. But, but basically what we're trying to figure out is how to responsibly enable a whole bunch of biotechnology to happen everywhere in a way that's not only safe, but equitable and all the other things you could imagine uh, you'd want to see figured out. Um, so without apologies again for my own, you know, parochial take on this stuff, uh, here, here are the, here are the, here's my representation of the lessons learned. I, I should back up and say for context, um, you know, President Kennedy in the United States had an executive order that said publicly funded work should be publicly available. That basically pendulum swung back um, towards the end of Carter and Reagan with what becomes the Bayh-Dole Act and very strong explicit patent frameworks, uh, in part lobbied by pharmaceutical and biotech, where you're basically uh, protecting things to get a lottery ticket, blockbuster drug, and so on and so forth. I I'm just observing that and, and giving that as an opening so that you can see what we've what we've experienced and built, I think, just gives us some options that position biotechnology at an interesting starting line right now, as opposed to we figured it all out. And it's great to follow Gavin and see all those lessons from something that's more advanced and mature, so to speak, uh, um, operationally. Um, so lesson number one, how can the me, 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 we all love ourselves, right, help the we, we, we. And Tom Knight, who I think hope and hope is still here, right, his insight with coordination of labor through standards and the invention of biobricks uh, really opened up a lot of eyes, including my own, to how people could work better together. That fit nicely with some scholarship from uh, management, economics, and the law, uh, David Graywall, among others, noticing how when people can work together, you can get network effects. And, and just that's, that's maybe obvious for everyone, but when you lift the lid on the significance of how other people can benefit you and then build capacities to really unleash that, um, uh, you know, incredible things follow from that. And I think we've just, we've just got to the point where that's, that's going to become possible for biotech. Um, a second lesson is oftentimes it's okay to not know what to do. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're operating within a very mature property rights regime and translation regime. But, but biotechnology is, is, you know, it's like, although it's dominated by patents in many respects, there's a lot of legal limbo there. And one of the early important conversations we had with Artie and James down at Duke Law in North Carolina was, you know, maybe you shouldn't worry too much about trying to figure everything out right away. And this was really essential in the early days of the iGEM, where the students in the genetic engineering competition were sharing biobrick parts, and we we're just kind of doing it. Um, you know, without worrying too much about exactly, you know, it's just we're going to operate under the radar a little bit. That's okay for a while. Limbo, as you know, is exhausting, right? But but it's okay to, to exploit limbo a little bit. Um, another thing that surfaced, lesson number three, was um, in a context where software is ascendant and hardware is ascendant and the property rights regimes from copyright to mask works are defined, um, maybe the thing to do is just set all that aside check the property rights at the door. And this was a lesson that came from the late Mark Fisher, an attorney who worked with Stallman on the GNU Emacs license long ago and helped us think about this and, and, and architected what became the Biobrick Agreement and recently the Public Domain Chronicle. Um, and so maybe, maybe just like set all this aside for a while. Don't let these existing IP regimes slow you down. They may not be, they may not be the best thing to, to pay too much attention to. Um, Lesson number four, uh, this is um, from Kathy Koo, the um, um, longstanding uh, chief of the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford. It's good to have options. Um, when I came into all of this, it was almost a fanatical religious sort of mindset where there's only one right way to do stuff. And, and Kathy um, uh, made it apparent that hey, you know, why don't you just relax a little bit and check out what we're actually doing? 
So I put on the right of this slide the patent policy for Stanford. And, and paragraphs one and two are, are just like everywhere else, typically. Um, you work for Stanford, we own your inventions. Uh, paragraph two, we're, we're a generous employer, we'll share some of the royalties with the inventor. But check out paragraph three. If the inventor wants to put the invention in the public domain, go for it. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Um, do I file an invention disclosure and then state that? No, 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 don't tell me that. Just put it in the public domain. Um, so um, I remember this conversation with Kathy. Like, oh, just have, you, have you read the options we're giving you? And, and this is interesting because when you look at the economics and culture around the valley, Silicon Valley out here, we construct a lot of wealth, both through explicit licensing regimes, but also public domain that floats all boats, a rising tide, so to speak. So it's good to have options, fourth lesson. Um, number five, um, I was really hung up on, on, on patents in biotech and Linda Kale um, uh, had this genius observation that um, you know, most of what's slowing things down are not the patents. Yes, they appear, the patent claims, but, but practically the patent regime has created a secondary regime, which is much bigger around material transfer agreements, these bilateral contracts that encumber how people share functional biomaterials. And so Linda really took this holistic approach to practically understand encumbrance in biotech. And, and you know, in so doing noted like patents are wonderful because they're the original open source approach. They are a complement to trade secrets from hundreds of years ago and they expire. So, so yeah, we have to mine the patent side of things, but think about the other stuff like the material transfer agreements and the open MTA that got developed um, um, with Jim and Linda and others uh, as a great um, a practical solution for basically giving people an option around material transfer agreements and having them not encumber transactions. Um, that's lesson number five. Lesson number six, <clears throat> the success of open enables private profits elsewhere. And I think we saw uh, sort of mature aspects of this um, in, in Gavin's remarks. Uh, this came from an amazing talk Tim O'Reilly gave with the link down below, the slides are available. I'd encourage everybody just go look at Tim's slides. Uh, and, and this observation comes from Clayton Christensen's work. And, and so, for example, if you've got hardware, um, you know, heading up to operating system and computing and you open up, you know, the the office, so to speak, you know, what does that lead to? And, you know, what happens elsewhere in the in the space and who owns the network? And you could have the source code for Google, but you don't have the database. so You don't really have Google. Um, and, and so just be mindful of, of when you construct an open technology framework in one layer of a stack or in one part of an ecosystem, what, what happens and who captures the, the adjacencies. Um, that then leads to, to, and I should, again, for emphasis say, um, all these lessons are sort of anecdotal and empirical over the last 20 years. I think the synthetic biology space, the biotechnology 2.0 space, whatever we want to call it, is at an interesting starting line right now. Um, and, and so just being mindful of some of this is, is what I'm trying to surface. This then sets up lesson seven, architecture of the system. And it, it draws upon something Tim related in the same talk, um, um, but I'll frame it independently. And so this goes back several thousand years to Lao Tzu and, and on this, this, uh, this reflection of power. And by power here, it's political power, causing other people to behave in certain ways. And, and so down in the bottom of this, this is Ursula Le Guin's translation, which is an amazing translation. Um, when we lose the way, the architect, the system, we find power, losing power or goodness, we find losing goodness, righteousness, righteousness, obedience. And Tim in his talk mapped this to software, right? So, um, you know, um, uh, goodness, the, you know, don't be evil, says a company in Mountain View. Um, righteousness, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, let's have a let's have a copyleft license. Um, obedience. Let's indoctrinate our students to contribute code under a certain set of terms and conditions. But but Tim was really trying to point out that if you can architect the system right, if you can structure the landscape within which things are operating, then that's just the highest form of enablement, so to speak. Um, and and the other thing, the flip side of it is, you know, and it was sort of a biting comment he made. I see a lot of smart people spending a lot of time arguing about licenses down here in the stack of governance, so to speak. And, and since you're also smart, it'd be better if you started to think about how to architect the system at a higher level. And, and I, that really resonated with me because all these lower ways of, of, of working together with people 
are exhausting. They're really exhausting and they're, they're almost intrinsically limiting. Um, Tim pointed us, and I still think this is a great tip, uh, to the work out of Bell Labs when Dennis Ritchie and colleagues uh, architected the Unix operating system. And, and if you track down the videos of how they're describing the, the choices they made in architecting that technology, they're thinking about how to enable people to work together as a fellowship of programmers. Um, and so what would it mean to architect systems in biotechnology that are um, purpose built to enable people to, to, to be open, so to speak, as opposed to forcing that through indoctrination and legal frameworks and so on and so forth. Um, again, in progress, I think we're at the starting line of this for biotech. Um, lesson eight, understand what you and others are aiming for. And um, I, I couldn't track down the exact person who said this quote, but I still remember the scene. It was at a uh, workshop hosted by the Board on Science, Technology and Economic Policy in the US. And it was held over at the Moore Foundation headquarters in Palo Alto. And, and um, the panelist I was speaking with was the retired chair of the electrical engineering department at UC Berkeley. And he, had, he was offering reflections to this board, which provides economic policy advice, including on, on um, you know, competitiveness and property rights for the United States government. And, and one of his two reflections was, over 30 years of partnership with Silicon Valley, we've learned that patents are important if you wanna start one company and giving things away is the way to go if you wanna launch an entire industry or sector. Um, and maybe that's obvious, but it was important for me to hear that from somebody in a position of, of authority and experience, if you will, from the Silicon industry. Um, and again, I apologize, I wasn't able to find the agenda, so I can't give the person credit for their, their remarks explicitly. Um, lesson number nine, openness has some real advantages. Here's one, and it was Tali Salmik, an investor uh, who pointed this out for me. Um, he was observing that the computer programming languages that are most used, um, even though they weren't all developed as open languages, free to use languages have become so, or tend to become so. so Languages are technologies or systems for expression of intention. And you know, you could pay to use the language, but ultimately the intrinsic cost of a language is the cost of learning the language. Um, you know, I don't pay to use the word word, um, right? It's, I just have to understand what the word means and how to use it. And, and so from Tali's insight, it, it sort of became apparent to me, um, which again may be obvious to others, that, that languages as systems are under selection, both positive and negative, to become free to use. Otherwise, there's a, there's a market that has to be created to sustain the private language. And, and so that made me feel really good. It, it made me feel like we're going to get one or more languages for expressing human intentions in life, and they're going to inevitably become free to use. Um, the patents are expiring, as Linda Kale uh, observed. And so in a way, my job might simply be to get there um, better, where better could be sooner or more responsibly in some way, but ultimately this is going to work out. And so, you know, the victory here is inevitable uh, in, in terms of this advantage, just when are we going to get, when, when are we going to get there, right? Um, and then uh, I think I have one more lesson as advertised. Um, don't cheat the long term. There are things in the realm of, of property rights um, that, that last quite a while. Um, here's an example, well-intentioned example, where perhaps we should take sequences of DNA and apply copyright to them. Um, now, copyright has some very appealing uh, uh, aspects. Um, you, don't, you, know, you don't have to pay for it, right? You get it at the time of, of, of the creative act. Um, it allows for copy left. Um, other other aspects of it. Um, now I'm not gonna. I don't know what this symbol is on the left of the slide, um, but you know um, whether it's copyright or trademark or something. I, one of the lessons for me is to take care. Um, I'm trying to imagine. Now I, I believe Mickey Mouse, the original Mickey Mouse copyright, actually expires this decade, um, but the newer Mickey Mouse won't. Um, Try to imagine what biotechnology is going to be like in the year 2040, 2050, 2060, 2080, 2100. 
when people say today that there's, you know, the degeneracy of the genetic code allows for many different variant sequences to instantiate the same function, so we shouldn't worry too much about copyright. That's true for nature's standard genetic code, but already we have designs of non-degenerate genetic codes in which there'd only be one code level option and so on and so forth. So, so I think there's, I, I can already see that within the biotech sector, there's gonna be a lot of short-term pressure and medium-term pressure to do some experiments with property rights regimes. And I think that's, I think that's good to talk about and explore, but, but I'm, a lesson is sort of pre-positioning a lesson is let's, let's be mindful of where this is landing as the biology and living matter operationally becomes really engineerable in ways that are hard to fathom in, in, in the moment. So um, that was a lot real fast, but I'm going to stick to time and, and call it, Call it a deck there, Jim. Great, thanks, Drew. So as I mentioned, we can take questions either by um, popping your hands up or writing something into the Q&A session. I don't have anything on my list yet, so I might just get the ball rolling. Really a question, I guess, first for Gavin, but then for Drew. Uh, Gavin, I was really quite impressed by the way you identified downside differentiators, which I hadn't really come across before, as a motivation for sharing, that where you've got this, um, I guess, need for assurance, safety, reliability, or whatever, um, that provides a motivation for, uh, I guess, a collective um, security, I suppose, in terms of development. Could you expand a little bit more on that? And I think there might be some opportunities to explore that in biology too. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the, the motivation, I guess, is, is you know, if, if you don't really care about something much, then it's easy to Treat it as a commodity because the, the the failure case is disabling. So then you just buy a commercial off the shelf thing, and that's what happens. That happens with lots of stuff. Um, if it's really core to your business and it's an upside differentiator, it's the core thing that people identify with your product or brand. You know, it's a search engine that gets you relevant answers quicker or something in your Google. Then that's your secret sauce, and you put developers on it, and you have no intention, and nor nor should you, you know, outsource that really or or, or try to commoditize it, right? But there's that other little weird intersection of the Venn diagram where um, nobody cares about it until it blows up, and then they really care, like the you know the seven three seven max type thing or whatever. Or um, you know if if Google servers got hacked or something, like that then people would care a lot about security, right? So otherwise they take it for granted. They'll say, yeah, 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 of course the plane's going to stay up. Yeah, yeah, of course the server isn't going to get hacked, and my data is going to be secure. That's what you guys do, right? But how you know quickly can I index it? How quickly can I do something else? That's what people want to you know care about until it's like fear and greed right greed is all important until you know but fear is a more important driver so that then gives you the the incentive to you'd like to outsource it but you can't and so now you're stuck on something which isn't productive actively productive for your business you're managing risk and you have a whole load of engineers stuck on that expensive engineers that could be doing other you know things that really have got upside um, so you'd like to get rid of it, but you can't. And that was, you know, I'd like to say we, we, you know, six and a half years ago, we sort of steely eyed, we saw that opening and we, you know, we navigated our way to it relentlessly. But of course, it, you know, it, it, it kind of just came together the way some of these things do, but um, through a series of, you know, happy accidents. But it is a real driver. And there's quite a lot of stuff out there where that's the case. And so how do, how do companies then get themselves off that treadmill and free up their limited resource inside their um, uh, you know, a corporate bubble to work on stuff that will, will, will improve their position from the upside. Um, that's a safety concern and that's open source actually provides a way to square that circle because they know what they're going to get. There's no mystery meat in the end product, um, but they can safely walk away from it in the end knowing that it's maintained. And from our perspective, you know, we get something from it as well as sort of hopefully explained in the presentation. The components that come out of that being maintained and being engineered to that sort of high level, the components of that total design are then reusable by others for other things. So we build a complete holistic design and bits of it, like the CPU core, are free fillers to take and use, knowing that it's got compiler support, knowing that it's got debugger support, knowing that it's going to be there for you know five years or whatever, which is an eternity for you know anything in the, in, in the sort of silicon space. Um, uh, and that that helps the open source domain as well. So there's a it's a, it's an unusual thing that people that's the motivating motivation for people to pay for. But I think it's a very, you know, you know at least for, for our domain, 
it's a very real thing. Um, so that's that's the that's the lowest hanging fruit. There are other things that people will pay for and and, and so on, but commoditizing safely um, it is it turns out quite a quite a major driver. And Drew, as uh, particularly biological systems get more complex, and there's the potential, at least, for having chassis type arrangements where you've got underpinning features or functions that people need to reuse. Do you see this as also a feature in biology potentially? Absolutely, Jim. Gavin, I thought that was brilliant. I have to admit the the combination of words was a, a puzzler for me initially, but but you brilliantly presented it. And I was just screen grabbing your your comments. I think you're exactly right, Jim. Safety safety is obviously a big concern. Uh, I, I need more time to think about it, but but that the the halfway additional context is um, in biotech, I think safety is not only a primary concern for for everybody, but it's also a source of proxy conflict. Meaning oftentimes you think about GMOs and GMO foodstuffs, um, a lot of times you'll have a conversation about the safety of that, but that's not the real conversation. The real conversation is who has the power? Is this equitable? Uh, you know, what's what's the relationship between the producer and the consumer? And, and are we citizens of this emerging bioeconomy uh, or are we just mere consumers or subjects or objects in it? So I think in addition to safety as a topic, um, um, there's other dimensions of, of this which which might do well to be upstreamed in biotech. And I, I just need more time to think about it. But I, I thought it was, I think your comments spot on, Jim. And Gavin, I thought it was, it was a brilliant lesson and I was thrilled to, thrilled to take it. Gavin, um, could you please um, talk a bit about the role of field programmable gate arrays, uh, gate array technology, uh, which allows low cost prototyping in this space? I guess the idea that you've got reconfigurable hardware yeah absolutely i mean and it is key so so um we actually use that extensively and you can you know you can take the uh, existing sort of open titan design and, and, and have it synthesized onto a, an fpga right now and we use that extensively in our continuous integration and so on but obviously when it gets to volume um that's where FP, fpjas are great they're fantastic technology um for prototyping for testing for running you know all of that in early stage um, design work that we do, um, and we use them a lot. The problem is, of course, the cost. You know, you pay for that flexibility, right? So there's always that trade-off. And an ASIC, a sort of fixed chip design, is always going to have the lowest power consumption and, and you know, and, and, and the best sort of trade-off in terms of you know cost per unit and all that stuff. So of course, that's why the world doesn't run FPGAs. It runs for the most part on on ASICs on on, on, on six silicon. But FPGAs used extensively in that prototyping phase. Um, and they are a fantastic enabler. And, and there have been various you know, approaches to try and bridge that gap, but none of them have been compelling really. So in the end, you, know, you, you have to, to, to really move the needle, which is one of our goal. You know, it had to be a design that yes, could use FPJ as a stepping stone, but would ultimately be translatable into the slightly you know, deeper and murkier waters of actually building a real you know, um, end ASIC. And that is where we're at. I mean, that's, that's, that's that project product boundary. It's dealing with all of those complexities. It's dealing with all those mass costs and fabrication costs and complexities and multiple spins and not being able to come back from it when it's wrong and all that stuff. But that's, that's, that's the, you know, that's the full growing up deep end of the swimming pool, which we wanted to, you know, we wanted to be able to do something there. Um, uh, but we of course use FPGAs extensively in, 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 in the design cycle, uh, you know, as, as everyone will, who's doing that kind of um, flow. Um, yeah, I, I think it, 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 again, it really depends upon your, you know, end target. So if you're I mean, background a long time ago, sort of DSP and software radio and stuff, stuff like that. So if you're trying to do a baseband um, that's going to be flexible, that's got a military application or something, then absolutely you, you're willing to have that flexibility, and you'll pay for you know a significant amount of FPGA in the real estate of the, the end device. If what you're trying to do is produce the lowest cost, lowest power. Um, sort of thing for for multi-million uh, you know uh, consumer endpoints. Uh, it, it's a different equation, and, and it's hard to justify what that you know the flexibility might save you a little bit from some design errors. It's probably not going to save you from some major pipeline issue in your in your in your CPU core or something. So um, you know there's, there's that sort of false generality versus um, you know what's the flexibility actually costing you. In, in, in default running, um, and so it's 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 a, it's a use case driven thing. So there are places where it works, and there are places where 
it doesn't. And we wanted to make sure that we could target and, and have a valid model for you know the places where it doesn't, because currently you know the world at least says commercially that's a lot of that's a lot of sockets. So. I would just offer a quick comment uh, from what I can see. I, I, I would say uh, it's a good question and it feels like the answer is yes. I dropped in the chat as one example, uh, a, a blog post um, out of the Netherlands, I think, which is a you know reverse engineering of the COVID-19 vaccines um, that gets to primary sequence level and then works back, like what's it all about? Um, and, and of course that's a relatively simple genetic construct. Um, um, uh, but but when you're, it's always been appealing to me that when you're doing something in the open, responsibility, provenance, traceability, uh, you know, trust basically is something that that seems apparent. What I what I don't know about, and and Gavin and Tom and Jim and others, I, I look to you is when you get to larger scale integrated systems, whether it be hardware or software, and ultimately wetware, but mostly hardware and software now, you know, whether how how exactly we get scaling of trust. Right, and what tools enable that, if, if, and so on. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge where things are so so large that you know people, you know, it's the it's the um, it's, it's a you know Raymond's old bugs are shallow and the and the, the sort of refutations of that saying yeah, but you know all these sort of huge things have happened out there in the in the you know supposedly open source to me and the heartbleed and stuff. Like these things have happened and it's you know they've, they've hit software that's been open to review for for forever so i think you know you can fool yourself thinking that, that stuff will be you know looked at by a you know a set of experts and that it will they'll they'll find it i guess there, there are various things and various levels in which you can look at that so for example we have inside um open titan i think called source integrity tooling which ensures that not only did the commit you know that when, when some bit of code is, is added to the design database um, that we know where it came from, but we also know that it's been adequately reviewed and signed off and so on. So each one of those actions creates a sort of blockchain style, you know, one thing's hash is tied into the next one so that you know that it's definitely got problems. So that's sort of micro level of it. So can you say that this that no one's come in and, you know, on a, you know, 11.55 on a Friday night inserted something that nobody saw, right? Well, you can, you can make sure that that didn't happen. Um, as to is the end artifact, Fit for purpose? Uh, does it? You know, that's a, that's a much gnarlier question. I, I guess it, it comes down to motivation, really. It's not just how many eyeballs you've got on a bit of code or a bit of silicon design, but whether those eyeballs care or have a brain that cares behind them, right? So, you know, we're helping um, companies whose um, survival would be on the line if the stuff that they produced wasn't valid. Um, uh, or that's that's the point. They want to outsource this stuff safely, if you like. So. Um, because if they get it wrong, the downside differentiation is huge. If, if you know, Google server state you know, was, was hacked, that would be the end of, of, of Google pretty much if it was a material enough hack. So um, because of that, um, they care. And because they've done it before, they have an understanding of how to build these things they believe safely. And so I think you can trust some of that stuff. Externally, then you're taking it saying, well, do I believe that the CPU core that sits in there hasn't got any you know, weird things built into it? I, I mean, you can verify it, and if you have a specific problem, you can tunnel in and check that. Um, as to you know, fitness for a specific purpose, I think that comes from you know, as, as, as always, it comes from the motivation of the of the people involved. So they're motivated um, to to make sure that it's safe. It's it's their it's their skin in the game and their you know, ass on the line, if you like, if it goes wrong. So at a top level, though, things get sufficiently complex, and that's part of the thing that open source is about, right? It's it's crushing complexity. It's making this huge big thing that's you know, breaking it down into smaller components that then wrap interfaces around, then you can treat those as components and zoom it up a scale and put those blocks together. And that's the way that you deal with complexity. Otherwise, you drown in the, you know, if you flatten everything, you drown in the leaves of the tree. Um, so ultimately, I'd be skeptical of, of, you know, review of large systems by experts and pronouncing them safe if they had no, if they weren't going to get on the plane, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily trust that they'd, they'd checked out the, you know, the, the flight control system for me. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Gavin. Uh, Drew? Thanks, Jim. Gavin, I wish to, I just want to ask you a question because uh, you, you, you presented low risk 
um, at least how I received it, primarily from the perspective of relationship to industry and creating value and 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 how that relates to a business model for a charity. And, and so that that really came across well. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and this is unfair. I'm like, I'm, fr I'm, I'm stating it aloud in a, a crude, imperfect way, but it's like, what, what are the other aspects of the, the mission, so to speak? And, and it, cause it, it seems to me, as we were just discussing, there's all these additional sort of cultural societal benefits, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure if they're in the lead or they're just coming along for the ride. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about, um, you know, Herman Hauser and his comments on technology sovereignty at the level of nation states and, and triggering competition or avoiding competition. So anyway, if you just sort of pop out from, from, from the, 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 the project and, and look at it, how would you represent the, the broader cultural social mission or is that however the best way to ask that question? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely, I mean, look, we're a CIC, we have a, we have a stated um, public interest, uh, you know, goal, and that's what we're, that's, that's the point. I, I, I guess, you know, coming here to talk about business models, because you hear, maybe this is unfair from my side, but you hear a lot of people try and achieve these things, and they're very worthy goals, but they, you know, because they aren't grounded in any reality, you know, Surprisingly enough, you know, companies look at it and they go, yeah, but that's kind of playground stuff or it's last generation or it won't survive, you know, the heat of battle type thing. I'm not going to look at your IP. It hasn't been properly verified. It hasn't been properly tested. It doesn't have proper coding standards. It's kind of a, it's fun and all, but, you know, we won't use it. So there's a, there's a level of reality that you have to put around something. And when the stakes are high and the upfront costs are very high, as with silicon design, it becomes harder to do the kind of incremental thing that happened um, and it was a genius way that it happened, but it, you know, it, it wouldn't be possible to do the Linux kind of, you know, um, parlay with, 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 with silicon because of this huge activation energy that you've got to get across of credibility and, and cost. So it was building something that could achieve that. But of course, you know, you know, from our perspective, our motivation, I've talked a lot about the motivation of others, because unless you align those, you're never going to get anywhere in, in this as in everywhere else in life. But our motivation, of course, is to make the open source silicon thing reality. We think it's a, you know, there, there's a reason that fabulous semiconductor companies are floated for, you know, billions of dollars. It's like they're replicating the same stuff. And that's a bit unfair to them. They do, they do really good design work. And so I don't mean to demean ARM and companies like that. But naturally, if you're, you're a licensor of anything, it's in your interest to keep, you know, doing the, you know, spinning multiple designs and fragmenting it and segmenting your market and, and, and selling it on and that obviously impedes progress because you end up with, you're competing with other companies who are also doing it in a closed source way. You've got lots of very bright engineers in their own little silos doing pretty much, you know, inventing pretty much the same wheel. Yours might be slightly different color, so you know, the number of spokes, but it's kind of still a wheel. So it'd be good if we could just be done already with the wheel thing and move on to the rest of the bike or whatever, right? So that's what we want to do. Progress exists when you can you know, take things that by themselves were complex and difficult to build and you can wrap an interface around them, you can treat them as a thing and then you can move on to the next level of complexity wherever you're building blocks, right? That's, that's, that's the way stuff works. And enabling that to happen is what we want to do because A, it's a good thing in itself because then you can go and build, build more systems. B, you're freeing people up to work on more interesting things. C, um, it's an enabler for lots of you know technology uptake, uh, you know, in, in in more developing parts of the world and things like that. For example, where they might not be able to pay the license fees, or whatever. That's the great thing about Linux, and you know, it's it's just open. Anybody can download it, work, use it, work on it. The barriers to entry are very low, and that's you know that's a fantastic thing for um, you know, making it available and open, and, and that is part of our goal. As to technology sovereignty, well, that's a, a very relevant and valid. Um, point. It's something that you know, governments are paying a lot of attention to. I mean, my argument would be that governments should invest. You know, <laughs> Mandy Rice Davis applies. You know, of course, I'd say that. Um, but you know, governments should invest in, in things like low risk. It would be a very relatively low cost vector for them to achieve what they want. You know, but the relevance of it is that we've managed, I guess, to stand it up without recourse to funding because a lot of things that wouldn't exist if the if the government catheter were removed, right? So, um, so, so yes. In short. We absolutely do have a public interest mission. We do believe in that. You know, we're hopefully not zealots. I mean, we're, but, but we do believe in the in, 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 in the good of what we're doing. But the trick is to get it done, right? And and where, where the activation energy is higher, it becomes harder. And so, of necessity, the business case is is, is a primary 
a primary thing to address. Just don't don't lose yourself in the. It's probably some proverb about that, but just don't lose yourself in the in the in the journey. I guess is, is the only thing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks for the question. First of all, you know, thanks for the opportunity to say it. So just, just for avoidance of doubt, you know, completely, that's the whole point. It's like, you know, here is this design, it's completely open. You can go to it. It's not like we will make it open or we promise to do it in the future or something. It's like, it's open right now on GitHub. You, know, you can go to that link on the, in the presentation um, and just, you know, download it and, and, and fork it today, if that's what you want to do. Uh, with our blessing, you know, we, we, we want people to do that. We want, we want them to succeed at that. And here is a well-founded, you know, set of you know work and tooling and so on around it that you can go off and do that with. That's that's point one. That's kind of the you know the, the there is the RTL and there's all the tooling flows around it to build it and all the scripting and stuff like that and the verification IP and all that stuff. So it's all there. You know, take it with our blessing. You know, and, 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 and you know that's fantastic and that's how the progress gets made because you didn't have to you know, reinvent that entire wheel just to change the valve on it or whatever it is you want to do, right? That's great. And that's the point, right? It's like 90% of a lot of these silicon designs, these SOC, system and chip designs, are, are common. It's like, yeah, but I just want my little custom accelerator to do my thing. Well, you've got to license the whole thing and it's you, know, you get sucked into that world. Not so with open source. So even if you want to modify some of the foundation elements, you absolutely can do that. The second point, though, is there's that all that, um, that governance structure and all that stuff. And part of our mission, I mean, it's not that we did it brilliantly and we had this in insight, you know, from the beginning, it's kind of, it, it grew and the rough edges got knocked off in the, in the sort of harshest possible way. But, you know, we, we've got something that kind of works. So part of our goal from that meta perspective is to share um, those governance structures and those document, those, the, the, the way in which you structure things in terms of your steering committees, technical committees, RFC processes adapted from the open source domain. You know things like uh, uh, embargoed repos where you keep things private for a period while they're worked on and make them public after time. Some interaction with the licensing, not you know uh, the, 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 the patent um, process and contributor license agreements that you have to do. There's a whole body of stuff that's built up around how you do the stuff, the practices of it, um, that we would also like to share because we think that's really valuable. Because it's like if you want to build a similar organization, whether it's in a parallel domain of like synthetic biology or it's a sort of a clone of low risk or it's a you know something different but sort of engineering focused all of that is kind of painful to get together right as well um so that hopefully will emerge from what we're doing as a kind of a package that you can just take down and at a meta level say yeah organizationally we'll have one of those please we want to tweak it a bit because that doesn't feel quite right that's not exactly what we want but again it's 90 percent there and we don't have to rebuild that so Hopefully that will be a, you know, a positive, a secondary positive outcome of, of what we're doing. Yeah, and, and, and exactly. Well, well, being able to feed it back into academia is a key part of it as well. I mean, that whole interface, we've taken things from, you know, academia with their, with their blessings. So uh, Professor Benini is, um, uh, has, you know, runs the ETH thing, and he's on our board. Um, and obviously, they contributed um, the, the the core that became the IBEX core that is now kind of been hardened and improved here, and is part of of the rest of the CPU core that others can then then use. Um, but that ability for for ac academic groups to hand stuff off is useful. But then the ability to bring that work, you know, back in again. And then say, well, okay, here's stuff that you wouldn't normally get visibility of because um, you know, chip companies are pretty secretive for reasons. Um, and they, they're not going to talk about their design flows and how they build stuff and their interim results and how they improve this and work around that problem and so on, because that's that's all their secret stuff. We're very open about that and that design is there. So again, that opens up a whole interesting array of things that people can do in the academic space, plus these braided careers. You know, uh, we have an engineer who works at ETH who spends you know, one day a week working uh, on the academic side of things and the rest of the time working working with us. So that flow is, 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 is really positive. And it's all about, you know, economics happens in the margin. It's all about the activation energy. Some things just take a lot of time and effort and people to do. 
but you know our goal is to bring that down from something that's you know, almost impossible to achieve unless you've got you know huge sums of money to throw at it's something that depending on the scope and scale and your ambition of how much you want to change becomes something you can, you can just download it and, and build it in, uh, on an fpga fabric now you can take the design down and, and play around with it right so if you want to make a small change you, you might even be able to do that with one or two people if you want to make a larger change it's more but it's way less than it would be you know if you were starting with a clean sheet of paper or you had to license it in, right? So that's the goal: is to you know bring that down and enable a whole new you know marginal set of people who can who can contribute. Um, so you know that's the goal. We all, you know all we can do is, is is basically you know make a first of all make hopefully hopefully successful example of it so that there's something for others to follow. And say yeah, open source hardware isn't by definition impossible. It's it's being done by you know once once the first once it's been done the first time, it becomes much easier for for others. Um, and also to leave, you know, artifacts as a result of that, that people can modify either directly or the component artifacts they can use in their own design. Some people have started to use the IBEX core, for example, and, and, and versus you can hunt around and get help and find a number of projects where it's being used, uh, silicon design projects. Great. Well, thanks, Kevin, and uh, thanks for the spirited discussion after the, the talks. I'm afraid uh, Drew's had to go off to another appointment, but uh, thanks, everyone. I think we've run out of questions. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone, attendees and all. And our next uh, in this monthly series is around accessible instrumentation, automated automation, I should say. Um, so that's our next um, forum. And uh, welcome you to that, if that's uh, in your area of interest. And uh, thanks, everyone. Bye for now.